on Sunday night. Take your Bible and go to Romans chapter 11, and we will continue in our study through Romans. Romans 11. Um, do any of you put uh, verses, Bible verses, in your prayer book to pray those verses? Any of you do that? Some of you know. Uh, now that's a good thing uh, to do. If you if you find a, a good Bible verse, put it in your prayer book. And uh, pray those, pray those prayers. There's a prayer over in uh, the Old Testament in Psalms. And the prayer uh, says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Now, that's a good prayer to pray. Put that in your prayer book. Pray the Lord brings peace to Jerusalem. Because the only way peace is going to come to Jerusalem is if Jesus Christ comes back and brings peace uh, to Jerusalem. Now tonight we're going to study a passage that uh, Paul says, if you can learn this, uh, you not be ignorant, you won't be stupid, and you won't be conceited. And so I don't think many of us want to be that, so we've got to learn this uh, here. So in verse, we're in verse 25 now in our study, and so we're going to read 25 down to verse 29. He says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. All right, so we're going to talk about this. This is one of the mysteries. There are seven mysteries uh, in your Bible, and this is one of them. We're going to talk about the partial blindness of Israel, or temporary blindness of Israel. So let's pray first. Father, we thank you for tonight, and Lord, it is uh, hot, but we are very thankful that this is the closest we'll ever get to hell. Father, I pray that tonight you'd please fill me with the Spirit of God. Uh, Father, wash away my sins in the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we take this blessed book and begin to look into it, I pray that you would open our eyes to the scriptures, teach us something. Many folks, this might just be a refresher. And Father, I pray that, uh, Lord, that you would please uh, help us to get a hold of what's uh, being taught here in the Bible here tonight. And Father, I pray that we would become better Christians because of it. Give us a better understanding of your word. And, uh, Father, if we ever do get the opportunity as individuals to witness uh, to a Jewish uh, man or a woman, I pray you give us wisdom, and uh, sure it be nice to see uh, one of them uh, get saved. Now, Father, we love you, and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, I have uh, this thing up on the board. I was trying to figure out the best way to explain this uh, to you with a drawing as well as going through the scriptures here tonight. And uh, if you have uh, Larkin's book, this is just a partial from uh, one of his drawings here. So I stole uh, part of his drawing there in his book. It's called The Relation of the Jew, Gentile, and Church to Each Other. So I'll just run through this real quick, and then uh, we'll start going through uh, the verses. Now, uh, Noah gets off the boat. He has three sons. He has Japheth, he has Shem, and he has Ham. From these are all the different nations come from. So you come from one of these three lines. So you're either Japheth, you're Shemitic, or you're Hamite. So what this is, is this is like your black race. This is your Oriental race. This is your white race. So these are where everybody comes from, these three races here. Now out of Shem comes Abraham. And from Abraham, you have Isaac, and then you have Jacob. And that's where our, the Jews come from. So sometimes, and I've already showed you this before, sometimes they're called Israel, sometimes they're called the Hebrews, sometimes they're called the Jews. So there's a false teaching out there that says the Jews are Judah and Israel is just the ten uh, tribes. But as I've shown you before, Paul says that he was a Jew and he also called Peter a Jew. And Peter was from the ten tribes and Paul was from Benjamin, the southern tribe. So they're used interchangeably. All right, well, so along comes, here comes Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ uh, comes along, the Jews uh, reject Christ. And the Lord talks about how their city is going to be destroyed and they're going to finally go into dispersion for the last time. So they end up going into dispersion. They lose their, their homeland. And for years and years and years, until 1917, when the Balfour Declaration was signed, Israel didn't have a homeland. You want to know one of the greatest uh, ways you know the Bible is true? Just look at the Jews. 
The, if you take, for example, some of the ancients, like the Phoenicians, they're gone. They're extinct peoples. But you look at the Jews, they went for a long time without a homeland, and yet they're still around. And look how much of their history they have retained. That is absolutely amazing. Why is that? God says in the book of Malachi, I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So because God is who he is, that's why Israel is still around. So see, that's a great proof that your Bible is not like any other book. It's an amazing book. I'm reading a story, a story, a, 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 a history book. It's called Jerusalem, the Biography. And the historian in it, he talks about the Bible, and he says that the Bible is, it's, it's, it's unique, it's full of a lot of things, but it's got a lot of fallacies in it. Uh, it duplicates itself. For example, it gives the creation account two times. And so at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, so, it gives that, so, it's, so he's trying to say it gives two different uh, accounts. You guys know the answer to that, right? Genesis 1 gives you the account, and all Genesis 2 is is a recap of Genesis 1. That's all it is. It's not, not like there's a mistake. They're just retelling it. I was thinking about this, talking to Brother Ralph about it. How many of you have ever done something amazing, and you didn't tell the story more than once? Yeah. <laughs> How come God can't tell the story more than once? Yeah. All right. So uh, where was I? Okay, so this guy talking about how the, his, the history of Jerusalem, and he's talking about how the Bible is, you know, it's a nice poetic book, but it cannot really be trusted, but it's an invaluable source to the historian. And then as he begins to tell his, his different stories about the Bible, he shows all the, ar uh, the um, archaeological discoveries that back up what the Bible claimed. For example, Hezekiah built a tunnel, and it was in like an aqueduct. He built an aqueduct. And, uh, and it talks, I think it's over in Book of Kings, it talks about this. And one day there was a couple of boys, and uh, they were living in Jerusalem, and they had heard about this, and so they wanted to try to, uh, to swim uh, to see if they could find this aqueduct. So they went down underground, and, and one guy started at one end, and another guy started at another, and they started swimming towards each other. Well, as they were going along, the one boy chickened out and left, but when the, the, the boy who went all the way through got to the middle, when he got to the middle, he found an inscription. Now, that inscription was put there by the guys that Hezekiah had actually uh, told to build the tunnel. And some of the architects started on one end, the other architects started on the other end, and they met in the middle. And when they met in the middle, they put an inscription on there. So this, uh, this author is writing about this, uh, about this account here, and he just keeps proving historically over and over again that the Word of God is true. But that just goes to show you when a man wants to reject the truth, he, he finds ways to reject the truth. And that's what that guy was doing. All right, so, uh, so the Jews uh, end up going to dispersion. They're going to come back one day. And uh, right now, there's uh, a lot of Jews in their homeland. A lot of them want to get back to the homeland. And what had happened is, is when Christ died on the cross, and then uh, later on in the book of Acts, the Jews reject uh, Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 7, they start uh, rejecting him after they rejected him here as their king. What ends up happening, you see a slow transition. I've showed you that, a slow transition from the Jews to the Gentiles. So take your Bible and go over to Ephesians chapter 2 real quick. Ephesians 2. So there's, there's, there's uh, three groups in your Bible, and if you can understand the three groups, it'll really help you. You've got Jews, Gentiles, and Church of God. Those are the three groups in your Bible. Okay, verse 12, Ephesians 2 and verse 12. That at that, uh, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So he's talking about the Gentiles. That's what we were. We were aliens. We talked about aliens yesterday, didn't we? <laughs> aliens from the commonwealth uh, of Israel. Verse 13. But now... In Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So now we are made nigh by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here you got a bunch of Gentile dogs. When Jesus Christ shows up on the earth, he comes not but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now some Gentiles did get dealt with, but that was not primarily who Jesus Christ came for. He came for, he said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But now, verse 13, but now. In Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one. So he made both Jews and Gentiles were one. We're one. We're one, as you're going to see, we are make up the body of Christ. So you've got, you've got two groups, Jews, Gentiles. 
And then the third group is the body of Christ. What are the Gentiles? The Gentiles come from these three guys right here. Out of Shem come the Jews. So we're all Gentiles out here. Here's the Jews. Now we're made one in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's look at verse uh, 14. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. All right, so the cross, uh, the cross of Christ comes, and the Lord said he made two, took those two and made them one. Now we're one body. That body starts here at the cross. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes down, and now it's made a living organism. Now, I don't know if I'm right about this, but I want to give you a, a type, a type. I was thinking about this. You take when the Lord made Adam. When the Lord made Adam back there in, uh, in Genesis chapter 2, he forms Adam out of the dust of the ground. And now you've got this body. He just formed him. They got this body there. And then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So here's the type. The Lord forms the body, and then in Acts chapter 2, breathes into it, and it becomes a living organism there. And I'm not sure if that's a good type there, but that's an interesting thought. All right, let's go back over to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11. Now, verse 25 says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. So we're not to be ignorant of something. Here's the mystery. And if we are ignorant of it, lest ye be wise in your own conceits. So I think it's interesting that this same phrase is used in Proverbs 26, where Paul said to answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. So some people just don't know any better. They just don't know any better. Uh, so what we're about ready to find out is Paul's about ready to say, you better watch your attitude toward the Jews. Watch your attitude towards them. So a lot of people, you start delving into the conspiracy theories, and if you're not, if you're not careful, you don't watch it, you're going to start making the Jew the problem for everything, and then you start hating them. And so you've got to be really careful about this thing, this thing about anti-Semitism. It is not, it's not of the Lord. Uh, it's of the devil is who that thing is from. All right, now let's look at the verse. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Blindness in part is happened to Israel. So there's a partial blindness that Israel has. Right now, if the, when you try to uh, witness to a, a Jew, there's a, there's a blinder there. They don't want to receive the gospel. You take the Jews as a whole, the nation. I uh, read something that said that the Jews, you're, they, they do not want Christian missionaries coming into, their, into Israel because in their mindset, it's coming in and it's destroying the fabric of their nation because the fabric of their nation is founded on the law of Moses and what happens when somebody gets saved, they are free from the law. And so they don't want those missionaries coming in. So we got to pray for our missionaries that go over there. The Lord helps them and gives them a lot of wisdom as they're dealing with these folks. Now, there's a blindness there. There's a blinder. When they read the passages in the Old Testament that you and I can see very clearly refer to Jesus Christ, when they read it, they don't think it refers to Jesus Christ. They think it refers to the nation of Israel as a whole or somebody else. They don't, they don't think it refers to Jesus Christ. All right, let's go here in verse 25. So it says that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So the question is, can a Jew be saved today? And the answer is yes, they can. They got to get saved the exact same way you get saved, by grace through faith. See that? Now, right now, blindness in part is happening in Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Take your Bible, go over to Genesis 15. The Bible talks about the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And when Abraham is given a promise from God, Genesis 15, he's given a promise from God that they're going to get the land. In verse 16, he says, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. Talking about uh, the descendants of Abraham will come back to the land. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. 
So it's as if God's giving the Amorites some time to stop what they're doing, and he just keeps letting them go and letting them go and letting them go. So finally, about the time Israel comes into the promised land and begins wiping them out, it would, the Lord had given them enough time. Do you, you ever uh, read some of the history about what some of those people were doing back in the land? Now, I'm not going to go into it because it's pretty raunchy. And they were doing some really bad things uh, back there in the land and their idol worship and the, uh, and the groves that they had. It was a lot of really bad stuff. And about that time, the Lord came in and said, that's enough. But you know what he did? He gave them time. Now, you know this in your own life. Doesn't the Lord give you time to straighten up and do right? Doesn't he give you time? Aren't you glad some of you, he gave you time to get saved? Amen. Didn't just kill you the first time you heard the gospel? The Lord gives them time. You know what the Lord's going to do one day? He's going to gather the Gentiles together. That's what this arrow is supposed to be. You can tell, right, from it? <laughs> he's going to gather the Gentiles together to fight them and to wipe them out. That's what he's going to do. Now, you know what the Lord's done? The Lord's given the Gentiles time. And you look at what they're doing with the time. Right now, especially our nation, man. I tell you what, I, 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 I'm reading some of the missionary letters from uh, one of our brothers over in Malawi, Africa, and he feels bad for us. He's in Africa, and he feels bad for us over here as Christians living here in the United States and the hard hearts and the coldness towards the gospel. Uh, when he got back on the field, he was excited that he got to get back on the field where he could at least be around people who wanted to hear the gospel. And what did I tell you guys? How many tracks was he getting out an hour? It was like 400 tracks an hour. It was, a, it was crazy. I couldn't even imagine that, getting out 400 tracks an hour. And just, uh, just talking to me. That's a, that sounds like a blessing right there. All right. So let's go back here in verse 25. It says that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So when the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, that's when the blindness will be lifted. It will no longer be partial blindness. So he says in verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Sion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And you know who Jacob is. That's Israel. All right, and so all Israel shall be saved. Hold your place here and go over to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45 and verse 15. Verily thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Now, if you remember, there's a parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 13 that when the, the, the man finds a treasure in the field, he hideth. And the way that thing is written is the man himself is the one that's hiding. And the Lord told Israel in Deuteronomy he would hide himself from them. When, if they walked away from him, that's what he would do. Verse 15, Verily thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. They shall be ashamed and also confounded, all of them. They shall go to confusion together that are makers of idols. But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. All right, so this goes right along with what we read over in Romans chapter 11. The Lord's going to bring salvation to Israel. Let's look at another one. Go over to Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah 12. Now, there is a false teaching out there that says, where the passage says, so then all Israel shall be saved. That means that every Jew that ever lived is going to be saved, so there's no need to witness to them. And uh, if you think about it, that you can easily debunk that. For example, um, remember when the ground opened up, Kor, Dathan, and Bar were swallowed up alive. They went down into the pit. The rich man was a Jewish man, and he's in hell. He calls Abraham Father Abraham. He's in hell. What did the Lord tell some of those Pharisees? He told them they were a generation of vipers who shall deliver you from the judgment to come, and he, 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 uh, he preaches at them. So there are, it, when it says, so then all Israel shall be saved, it's not all the Jews in all time. You still need to witness to them if you get a chance to witness to them. Yeah. All right? So then all Israel shall be saved. You're going to see it's all those Jews that are here at this time when the Lord comes back. So maybe I didn't uh, give my arrows here, but I think you got, most of you know them. 
So what's happened? The next thing we're waiting for is we're waiting for a rapture. We're waiting to get out of here. We're not, uh, we're not going to go through the tribulation. We're waiting for a rapture. A pre-tribulation rapture, up we go. And then we have this thing here. This is the judgment seat of Christ. And I appreciate a brother drawing a better chair than I could draw. All right, this is where we stand, the judgment seat of Christ. This is what every day you ought to live your life in light of. You've got to give an account of yourself when you stand before the Lord of everything you've done in your body since you've been saved. That right there is going to be a terrifying day for me. I am scared to death of that day. The Bible says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, and that terror is not talking about hell. The context of the passage deals with the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be a terror. I mean, could you just imagine standing there looking at the Lord as everything is laid out and looking him eyeball to eyeball? I don't even know if we're going to be able to look him in the eyes. All right, after that judgment seat of Christ happens, back we come with the Lord at the second advent. All right, now, this is what we're reading about here. This period of time right here, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah 12, let me get my passage here, verse 9. Zechariah 12, verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So they see him come back and they see the one whom they pierced. Who did they pierce? Jesus Christ. And they're going to see him and they're going to believe on him. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadad Rimmon in the valley of Megiddo. Now, how do we know that that so then all Israel shall be saved is talking about these guys here, not throughout all time. Notice verse uh, 12. He names a bunch of families. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, the family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart, all the families that remain. Every family apart, and their wives apart. So it's those that remain comes along here, and so all Israel shall be saved. So here's the point. The point is that the Gentiles are turning against the Jews. You don't. You don't turn against them. Why? The Lord says they're beloved for the Father's sakes. So the Lord made a promise way back here. He made a promise to Abraham. That promise went to Isaac. And then that promise went to Jacob. And the Lord said he would keep his promise. He made a covenant with them and he doesn't lie. He's not like you and I. You ever made a promise and didn't come through on it? Aren't you glad the Lord's not like you? <laughs> the Lord makes a promise. He comes through on the promise. All right, so let's go back over to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11 and verse 25. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness for J from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. This is the Lord's covenant that he made with them. All right, uh, we'll go over to Hebrews 8. Hold your place here. Go to Hebrews 8. We'll read a passage over there. Hebrews 8 and verse 8. He says, For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, that's not spiritual Jews. And that's, that's, that's the house of Judah and the house of Israel. These are the 12 tribes. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them out of, uh, by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. Watch what he does. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in the hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. So one day God and his people are going to be reunited. Uh, everybody likes those, um, those movies, you know, where two people end up getting reunited after, they, you know, after a long time. Everybody likes that. 
Well, you read through this book, you know what you read? You read about God and his people, and one day they're going to be reunited. And when they're reunited, Jesus Christ is going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem, and all the nations are going to come before him and bow to him and say, Blessed be King Jesus. Boy, wouldn't that be a day? <laughs> I mean, uh, where it's just peace and righteousness, everything is wonderful. Uh, could you imagine if all, all the billboards, you know, all, you see now all the billboards, and, and now you got these billboards up, and it says, you know, you know, praise be to Jesus, or something like that, you know. See some people, some crazy guys marching down the street singing all hail Emmanuel as they're walking. Boy, that's going to be a great time, going to be a great day. Amen. All right, let's go back over to Romans chapter 11. So the Lord may, is going to make a covenant, a covenant uh, with, the, with uh, Israel and Judah. He says, this is his covenant with them, when he shall take, when I, that's the Lord, shall take away their sins. Now, Paul gives an admonition. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. So the Jews don't like the gospel. They don't want you to preach the gospel. They don't like the gospel. So when it comes to the gospel, they're enemies of the gospel. But then he says, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the father's sakes. So because of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and all of them, and all the covenants God made with them, they're beloved because of that. So you know what you do? They're what we call beloved enemies. So you, you don't go against the Jew. Pray our nation doesn't go against the Jew. Uh, right now, all of the, uh, the way the atmosphere is, man, you have no idea what's coming next. And pray they don't, don't go against the Jews. Uh, I think one of the reasons why, or two reasons why the Lord has not uh, destroyed our country is one, because we've backed the Jews all these years. And number two, a lot of the missionaries, hence here, a lot of the missionaries come from the United States. And they're good. The, the, the outreach is going out throughout the entire world. So, uh, so don't ever start going down that line where you start uh, saying, oh, it's all the Jews' fault, and then you start leaning into that anti-Semitism. And a lot, of these, a lot of these conspiracy theorists end up down that road, and that's a wrong road to be on. Uh, what was it Bob Jones Sr. used to say? You can go down the right road with anybody as long as on the right road. But well, is it? Is that, uh, it's not, yeah, something like that. When they get off the right road, Get off that road or something. I forget what it was. But if somebody's on the right road, you can be on that road with them. Where they get off of it, that's where you part ways. Now, for us, our guide is this book right here. That's our guide. Now, here he says in verse 29, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Now, there are some things that the Lord will repent about, and there are some things that the Lord will not repent about. Uh, so, for example, you take uh, back there, the Bible says that it repented God that he had made man. And so he ends up wiping out the entire world uh, with a flood. But there are other things that the Lord will not repent about. He will not change his mind about. He said he was going to do it. It's going to happen. I'm glad one of the things he doesn't change his mind about, he doesn't change his mind about my salvation. He said, I'll save you and I'll keep you saved. By the way, that's a big thing that's permeating our churches nowadays. A lot of people are getting talked out of their salvation. And somewhere along the, the road, you, be, you, you think maybe you didn't pray right, repent right, do something right along the way, and you keep getting attacked about this thing. You need to go back and figure out what is it that you were trusting in to get you to heaven. When I got saved, I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's what I trusted in. If that's not enough, nothing can save me. And if that's not enough for you, nothing can save you. You don't put your faith in how much you can pray through or how hard you can believe. or you, It's not that, or I got to keep repenting and keep repenting and keep. No, man, what are you trusting in? What did you put your faith and trust in? What did you do, what did you do that? I put my faith and trust in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ because I did not want to go to hell. And I'm thankful uh, that my mom was my Sunday school teacher at the time. And, man, she taught a Sunday school lesson on hell. And I did not want to go to hell. I remember that. And I said, man, I, need, I want to be saved. And I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Now, if that's not good enough, nothing's good enough. Right. Nothing is good enough. But it is good enough. So what did the Lord do? The Lord made you a promise. All right. He says uh, in John 10, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Never perish. Uh, that perish as perishing in hell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. All right, are you saved? Well, the Lord said he would keep you saved. Isn't that a blessing? You can't lose your salvation. 
Now, that's a promise God made. That's a promise he made. How about this? We heard in the uh, uh, lesson uh, here this morning, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Anybody ever found uh, the Lord left them? <laughs> no, he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. He's mine. Uh, I am my beloved's and he is mine. Uh, I, I, it's a mystery, but the mystery is this, that Jesus Christ is living inside of me. Uh, the Bible says, uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I don't understand that. The Lord Jesus Christ is inside of me. What in the world would he want to be inside of me for? I mean, I know me. I see where I go and what I do, and I know my thoughts. I, why would he want to be inside of me? There's this uh, weird teaching that's coming out now that's, uh, that's saying, that goes something like this. And saying, uh, God didn't, God didn't uh, come to this world uh, to save us because we were uh, sinners. He came to this world to save us because we were sons who had lost our identity. That's stupid. Amen. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. I was a sinner. <laughs> I knew I was a sinner. I needed a Savior. And so I'm saved. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The Lord made a promise to me and... He's going to keep it. All right, now in context here, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So the Lord made, uh, made a uh, calling on Israel and gave them gifts, and the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So the Lord made a promise to them, and he's going to come through on his promise. No matter how dim it looks or how bad it gets, he made a promise, and he'll come through on it. Now spiritually, you can apply this to you and I as individuals. And uh, if the Lord gave you a gift, and he gave you a calling in your life, what are you going to do with the gift and calling that God has given you? Uh, God's given some of you some gifts. What are you doing with it? Are you using it for him? Or are you keeping it to yourself? How about this? You take whatever you have and you lay it on the altar before the Lord. I remember um, hearing Dr. Uckman preach when I was down in school, and he got up one day and he was talking about the different uh, things that, that, uh, that he does, and he would draw and uh, played music and taught us hand-to-hand -hand combat in, uh, in, in, preacher, in his preaching class. And he would, all, all these things that he, that he had, uh, had done. And he said, uh, he said, look, what are you doing with the things God gave you? He said, I took what I had and I gave it to the Lord. And said, okay, Lord, use it however you see fit. How about it? What are you doing with what God gave you? The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Uh, if God's called you to preach, you're going to do it. You going to do it? All right, let's go now to verse 30. Verse 30, we'll continue our lesson. Uh, For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet now obtain mercy through their unbelief. Thank God that we got mercy. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also might obtain mercy. Uh, how, about, uh, how about don't stop witnessing? Uh, keep passing out the tracks. Uh, I like what the brother said this morning. I agree with that. You don't get a burden for souls until you start trying to witness yourself. And I like what he said. Get your own stories. <laughs> That's good. Some of you need to have some stories where you led somebody to Christ. That's good stuff. All right, it says, verse 32, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. And thank God for his mercy. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. You cannot match the depth, depth of God's wisdom. You cannot find out the riches of God's knowledge. There's no way you can find it. They're unsearchable. He says in the text, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. A uh, good illustration is imagine you get an ant. An ant is walking around on the ground. Here's this little ant wandering around on the ground. And that ant looks up at you. And if that ant has a mind to think, I wonder what's going on in your head. You know, and he names your name. What's going on in your head? Why do you eat? <laughs> Why do you sleep? Why do you do the things you do? Why do you yell sometimes? Why do you cry? Why do you? And from the ant's perspective, the ant's looking at you and it doesn't have no idea why you do what you do. You know, why do you have to have a house? You know, just, you just find any place and just go there, you know. Uh, why do you sit on the couch and wait for the government to take care of you? Why not worry? You know? <laughs> so what do you take? You take, here's this little ant, this little ant wandering around, right? And this little ant wandering, and looking up at you and wondering what you're doing. Now, let's take you as the ant and God, who's, he's way above you anyway. <laughs> How in the world can you figure out what's going on in God's mind? 
Some of you are reading your Bible for the first time. You're coming through the first time, and some of the stuff you're reading, you're like, man, I, I, don't, I can't get it, right? And then you read it a second time. I still don't get it. <laughs> then you read it a third time and a fourth time and a fifth time and a sixth time and a tenth time and a twentieth time and a thirtieth time, and you're going to realize eventually that the, uh, whoever wrote that book knew a lot more than you did. <laughs> Think about it. For the past 2,000 years now, uh, the church has, been, has had the writings of the Lord, had this book here. Now, it's a piecemeal at different times, and they've been studying that book, and they've been going over it. And a lot of really smart men have studied this book, and the church collectively as a whole has not even exhausted God's book. That shows you that God's wisdom and God's mind is so far beyond our minds, so far beyond it. And... Uh, so you got, uh, thank God that he gave us his book. Uh, many times when, I, when I'm praying, I get down on my knees and say, Lord, thank you for giving us this book. I mean, if you look at us, here we are in the Laodicean age. Why do we deserve to have an entire book right here, all the notes from different men throughout history who've studied, and we have this whole entire book right here. You can have it on your phone. You can have several copies in your house. Do you know how many... Uh, how many uh, uh, men in church history would have died to have a complete Bible? And many of them did die just to have a portion of Scripture. And yet we have it here today. <laughs> Every time I think about that, I think to whom much is given, the same much is required. All right, let's look at verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. And so in light of the entire context, you look at how uh, Israel has been and how the Lord's dealings with them, and now he's dealing with us as uh, both Jews and Gentiles and the church. How are you going to figure all that stuff out? You can't figure it out. God's, God's ways are unsearchable. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out for who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? What advice are you going to give the Lord? Now, on a side note, how, uh, how come I like to do that in prayer? <laughs> uh, anybody ever do, do that in prayer where you come along, you're praying, and you say, now, Lord, <laughs> if you just do this, this, and this, it'll, this will work out <laughs> really well. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever given the Lord suggestions on how to answer your prayers. I've done that before. <laughs> and then you read along there, and you're like, Lord, you don't need my help. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if the Lord needs my help, you all are in a lot of trouble. <laughs> but he doesn't need my help. He doesn't need your help. He keeps your heart beating. He keeps your mind working, the brain sending the signals and the neurons and all. Everything just working. He keeps that. He doesn't need our help. All right, for who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? I'll tell you, anything given to the Lord is never wasted. There's a famous passage, a story about a woman in the Bible who broke an alabaster box. Remember this? She broke an alabaster box over, uh, over the Lord and poured out that ointment. And Judas was standing off to the side and he was watching that whole scenario unfold. And as that ointment and that box was broken open, he looked at it and he said, that could have been sold for 300 pence and given to the poor. And uh, that was the price that he put on it, 300 pence. That could have been sold for 300 pence and give it to the poor. Now, when the Holy Spirit writes about it, he says that the ointment was very costly. Now, we're to th we think when we read what Judas put on it, 300 pence, that that was the cost that the Holy Spirit was referring to. But I don't think the Holy Spirit was just referring to the monetary value that that box represented. Maybe it represented a whole lot more. Maybe to her it was something really special. Maybe there are things about the alabaster box you don't know anything about. Maybe it was a gift from her mother. Maybe it had a lot of sentimental value to it. Maybe if she had taken that box and sold it for 300 pence and given to the poor, she would have been debt-free for the rest of her life and just been living on easy street. Maybe, maybe that box was her retirement fund. You have no idea what that box represented to her, but the Holy Spirit did, and he says it was very costly. He sees all that stuff. The Lord sees everything that you give up for him. He sees every sacrifice you make. He sees everything you do for him. How many of you have ever done something for the Lord and you didn't want to do it? For example, I'll give you one on a day-to-day -day basis. You ever rolled out of bed to read your Bible in the morning and you don't want to do it? You just want five more minutes? But you know that if you don't, what's going to happen? You're going to end up rushing and getting out to work. And then you, oh, and what do we tell ourselves? I'll do it when I get home, right? 
The Lord sees all that stuff you give up for him. He sees what a lot of you did to get here in church tonight. He sees how you got the kids ready. He sees how you're hurting. He sees how you're rushing to get here, how many of you are tired and you're forcing yourself to stay awake. He sees all that stuff. And anything that you give to the Lord, he sees it. He'll pay you back. He'll pay you back. All right, let's read this last verse. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. And uh, man, I tell you what, it's going to be a wonderful day when we get home to, uh, to glory and we can see the Lord in person and sing with perfect pitch at any range we want to sing, any part we want to sing, and just magnify and praise Him. Until then, think about this, think about this. The old timers used to have a saying, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. So I want to wrap it up with these thoughts. First of all, with all the different conspiracies that you see out there and the hatred towards the Jews, don't get caught up in it. They're still God's beloved. They're beloved enemies. All right, so don't get caught up in that kind of stuff. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So I want to ask you, spiritually applied, what gifts has God given you? What calling have God given you? And how are you using that for Him? And last of all, why don't you think about the mercy that God had on you when he didn't have to have mercy on you. And thank God he had mercy on you. And let's live every day in light of the judgment seat of Christ in giving God all the honor and glory we can with our lives. All right, let's all stand. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. Uh, that, Lord, we got to learn here tonight about the, how you're going to restore the Jews and Lord, one day all Israel shall be saved. And Father, I pray that if there's someone in here who's gotten caught up in that, uh, a lot of those conspiracy theories and that anti-Semitism, I pray that they repent of it and get that thing right, not go down that road. It's just going to mess them up. And Father, I pray that uh, if someone in here kind of is doubting their salvation, we touched on that for a little bit here tonight, I pray that you'd help them to nail that thing down and make sure of where they're going to go when they die and what they're trusting in to get them to heaven. Uh, Father, I pray that you'd please help each and every one of us to take every single day and give it to you and live our lives in the little things that we do, whether we're eating or drinking or whatever we're doing. Let us do it all to the glory of God. And Father, we sure do hope that you come back very soon. We do pray that you'll bring peace to Jerusalem. We know there's a lot of events that have to happen before that. And so, Father, we look forward to you coming and getting us out of here and taking us home to be with you. Until then, help us to be found faithful and be where we're supposed to be, doing what we're supposed to be doing. Now, Lord, we love you and ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's sing a song, and then we'll... Uh...